Thanks for those uh, kind words, Patty. We hope we'll be able to uh, live up to your uh, reputation that we've been given. Uh, I <coughs> was asked to talk about the changes after the First World War. And uh, I, I was going to spend some time talking about the changes that happened before that, but I, I decided uh, it would complicate things too much. Uh, the war finished in '45, and uh, uh, even though food was very scarce in England and, and everything that, uh, that was edible could be sold, uh, prices were bad and prices were controlled. Uh, you had uh, uh, compulsory tillage during the war uh, so that the country wouldn't run short of wheat. And uh, if you had to force people to do something, they're not being paid very much. And uh, obviously there wasn't a whole pile of money out of, uh, out of growing wheat during the war years. But when the war was over, uh, the country was poor and the farmers were poor. Uh, I, I said farmers were nearly worse off in 1945 than they were in 1914. That in that 30 years there was very little progress made in farming. Uh, and when the, the following year then was 1946, and uh, that's, uh, the autumn of 1946 turned out to be very wet. And uh, all of the tillage that time was uh, done by horses, there was no combines or anything like that. And uh, uh, it was an awful job to save the, the corn. It didn't appear to be the same problem with the hay, it appeared to be a corn problem. But, uh, uh, they closed the schools in 1946 for two years, for two weeks, to give uh, the pupils a, a chance to help with the harvest. You can imagine the force that it cost today. <laughs> uh, uh, um, my memory of uh, the first memory of that kind of time is I just barely remember uh, ration books. Uh, I, I think rationing in Ireland would have been, would have been abolished about 1947 or 48. But uh, rationing uh, continued in England uh, until 1954. That, uh, it wasn't fine, uh, different uh, foodstuffs uh, were cleared from rationing earlier. But I think it was meat that was the last thing to be cleared in, in, 1940, in 1954. Uh, at that time, uh, well, certainly in where we lived anyway, in Glen Island, uh, we had two travelling shops. Uh, a travelling shop came around on a Monday and on a Thursday, and uh, you bought whatever you needed for the uh, week from those two travelling shops. And uh, the travelling shops bought eggs as well, and eggs were, uh, you might say, a significant money spinner at that time. For farmers. Uh, farmers were to a large extent uh, self sufficient. Uh, they pretty well had to be. Uh, they had enough of butter and milk and potatoes and vegetables and eggs and uh, uh, bacon. Uh, and of course, they had plenty of turf. In, uh, but times were changing. Uh, we had a change of government in 1948, and uh, uh, James Dillon brought in what they called the, uh, or started what they called the land project in 1948, and that was the first reclamation scheme since the Congested Districts Board uh, back in the early years of the century. Uh, the uh, land project uh, paid 30 pounds an acre. For reclamation. Uh, there was no machinery here to do any significant reclamation. Farmers would do uh, uh, two or three acres in the winter. Uh, if I'll just show you a slide uh, A picture uh, from the Congested District Board collection and uh, I have a few photographs from them. I have other photographs from the uh, Museum of Country Life in Castlebar, and I uh, have one or two from uh, Paddy Duffin. 
uh, <coughs> that's a photograph with they don't know where it was taken and they don't know uh, who's in the photograph but uh, uh, what you have there is uh, uh, the, the uh, congested district board officials I think they were after get off the side car you see there at one side and they're asking uh, looking uh, for directions from this lady uh, uh, judging by the way they have turned out their VIPs and the fact that there was a camera there uh, I think they probably were VIPs uh, you, you had uh, uh, Tom's in Gatton in Casabar uh, and uh, I don't know now if one of them is him or not but uh, I, I think the significance of that is the, is the lady with the cleaver talk and what should be asking yourself is why, has she, why is she carrying the cleaver talk and the size of it uh, um, what one would say is that her husband was probably in England or in Scotland that he wasn't at home and uh, 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 the reason she's carrying the cleave at all is she doesn't have an S an S would carry two cleaves and she could only carry one uh, and uh, that uh, was the standard of living in the uh, in the start of the century and uh, that's, you might say, things were bad in uh, 1950, but uh, they were an awful lot better than they were in, uh, in 1900. The Congestion District Board did a huge amount of work, and invested a huge amount of work in, in land in Ireland, and uh, they changed, the, what's it, they changed the landscape. Uh, when the Congestion District Board came into being, practically all of the land was owned by the, land, by the landlords. Certainly by 1950, even though times were bad, the farmers owned the land. Uh, after the war, a uh, chip killed small farm uh, uh, in, in Mayo would be about 30 acres. Uh, they'd have uh, three or four cows and uh, their calves, three or four calves. Uh, the cows and the calves would be housed for the winter, tied up, and the uh, yearlings would be uh, wintered outside and they'd be sold in the spring, but in the spring they'd be only six or seven hundred to eight. Um, I, I remember when I started going to fairs, say around 1915, we'd be getting 25 or 27 pounds for, for yearlings, or for cattle rising two year olds, so they, they weren't very big. Uh, I, I, I know one of our neighbours would be getting even less because his cattle wouldn't be quite as good. <coughs> Uh, they'd have uh, maybe 15 or 20 sheep uh, and the lambs wouldn't be well, big enough to sell in the back end and they'd be held on and sold as weathers the following year. Uh, their, you might say the fashion for lamb meat hadn't developed uh, in the 1950s and uh, what was eaten was mutton. Uh, it had a stronger taste than uh, uh, than lamb, but uh, the taste of food, I think, is kind of personal and it's a matter of what you're used to and what you, how you expect it to taste. Uh, every farmer would have uh, a kind of 15 or 20 or 25 hens, and uh, uh, at that time uh, there was a good price for eggs. And, uh, there was a scheme to get people into uh, yes, egg production up and uh, all the egg production at that time was uh, on small scale. The production that we know today in these big uh, uh, layer units, uh, hadn't, uh, uh, that technology hadn't been developed at that stage. Uh, as well as that, they'd have uh, uh, a few ducks and a few geese. Uh, they'd have um, uh, maybe half an acre or an acre of oats and uh, the same amount of potatoes and four or five acres of hay. 
that she, it, it, they, they bought very little. Uh, only a small number of farmers kept pigs, but uh, uh, where they did, the pigs were worthwhile. The income from farming around 1950 probably wouldn't have been a whole pile more than a hundred pounds. And uh, men had to uh, try and live on that. Uh, um, they also had the dole at that stage. And uh, the, the dole was a kind of double-edged sword. If you uh, got the dole, uh, you, you asked at because your income uh, from farming was at a certain level. But if you improved, your door was cut, so there was no incentive to uh, uh, to improve. But uh, that was changed in the 1960s, and the uh, uh, door was fixed on the valuation of the land. And uh, regardless of how well you're done on the land, yeah, you, the, the, if you were entitled to the door uh, on a valuation, you got it. Uh, England at uh, that stage was the, you know, the only market for food and it appears from all this talk about Brexit that not much has changed, <laughs> that uh, we're still very dependent on, on Britain. Uh, but everything uh, uh, you could produce could be sold. Uh, there was a good market for these hens when they had their time served layer. They were worth about five shillings. And, uh, uh, during the war uh, and afterwards, while uh, uh, meat was scarce, uh, people made, uh, uh, well, maybe not a living, but they supplemented their income uh, from selling rabbits. You could get uh, uh, three shillings a rabbit, and uh, they were sent, uh, they'd be sent on from the train station here to London. Uh, I, I was born in 1941, so I was, you might say, I was growing up in the 50s. Uh, we didn't think, we didn't think times were bad because uh, everyone around us was in the same boat. Uh, but uh, there certainly was plenty of work for young lads to do, and there was little danger of them getting over fat. <laughs> uh, weren't short of exercise. One of the jobs that uh, a, a young lad could do uh, was uh, uh, what we'd call pitching potatoes. The potatoes uh, were set in ridges three feet wide, and there was uh, um, three uh, potatoes set across the ridge. And there was another line then at 15 inches apart. And whoever was uh, uh, the strongest had the spade, and they put down the spade, uh, the depth of the spade and then push the spade forward to leave the space behind. And the young lad with the bucket uh, pitched his slit, as we'd call it, into the space behind the spade. And that was how the potatoes were planted. They didn't plant full potatoes, they, uh, what they call them, slit the potatoes. Uh, they cut a piece off with uh, an eye or a boot in it. And, uh, uh, it would take a ton of potatoes to take her if you were to uh, uh, set them whole. But with this way, you got by with uh, six or seven hundred dress. And uh, you had a few uh, uh, potatoes then that could be fed to the calves or the dog after. Other thing that uh, uh, we often had to do during the summer uh, was help at haymaking. And, uh, <coughs> That certainly wasn't a popular job. Uh, the first year I remember was 1950, and it was an awful wet year. And uh, you'd be out and you'd shake the hay and turn it <coughs> and lap it and get heavy rain, and you had to do the same again the next day. And uh, eventually it was cocked and it was half rotten. Uh, and I remember uh, that particular year I had to, uh, in, uh, the hay be Farked up onto the hay shed, I had to put her back to my father. And uh, I was nearly smothered with the <laughs> dust of this uh, rotten hay. Uh, I, I never got that dust again in hay after. Thanks be to God, or I'd have a farmer too. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, hay making uh, was a hard squad if uh, uh, he didn't get good weather. 
But uh, not every year was bad. Uh, 1955, uh, it was an awful hot, dry year. And uh, that year uh, we, we learned to swim. And uh, uh, we had plenty of time for swimming. Now, there was, uh, the hay was made uh, towards the end of July. Normally it should go on for another three weeks. And uh, uh, it, it, our cousins were uh, just a few fields away. And uh, we'd go down in the evening and we'd whistle and they'd come down uh, when, they had their, when they had their work done in the evening. Uh, <coughs> There was uh, uh, young lads, uh, the cows had to be milked nice and warm and, and the calves fed. And uh, the cows had to be uh, brought in for milk and, and driven out again. Uh, and uh, that's what the, a job young lads could do. Uh, we, we weren't any good at milking, but we were able to, we were able to drive the cows. And when the uh, milking had been done, uh, We'd, uh, we'd go swimming and we'd be there kind of nearly at the dark. So not every year uh, was, uh, not all our memories are unpleasant. Uh, the other job that uh, you could do at that stage was, uh, there was a good British ceremony <coughs> in Cook Notes. Uh, in Cook Notes was a side. Uh, oats was cooked first, <coughs> and oats into the swarts. Then <coughs> it had to be uh, what they call lifted, which was meant to put it into sheaves. And uh, they were left out on the ground, and some other money came along and tied them. And when they were tied, then uh, in the evening they could be stooped, where you put uh, uh, six or eight uh, sheaves standing up together. Uh, but a young lad of nine or ten would be able to tie. Uh, uh, to tie oats. It was only a matter of taking 10 or 12 uh, um, stalks of oats, winding it around the shape like that, and twisting the two ends, and then putting the, the band under itself. And uh, if you had done that tight enough, you had a good sturdy shape. If you hadn't uh, tight enough, the shape would fall apart. The other thing that uh, uh, gave us plenty of work to do was uh, uh, in sheep. Uh, that was in the year before sheep wire. Uh, you only had some fences and stone walls and uh, uh, barbed wire. And barbed wire wasn't much good against uh, hungry sheep. Uh, the sheep would be brought down for lamb around St. Patrick's Day. And, uh, They'd be uh, happy enough with where they were for a few days after they came down. And uh, then uh, the place would be starting to get bare. And uh, they'd start trespassing. They'd be uh, going to the neighbours at, uh, at daylight in the morning. And uh, you had to go up there and uh, turn, them, turn them back. And, uh, they generally knocked the neighbours' fences and uh, did a bit of damage and you had to be repairing these fences or cutting a bush and sticking it in the gap and hoping that uh, they wouldn't find it easy to get in the next morning. Uh, uh, we kept an eye on sheep at lamb and time and that was a pleasant job going out in the morning and finding young lambs and being able to say that you had uh, found five or six it was nearly as good as, as all of them. Uh, uh, the ground would be very bare towards the end of April and the sheep would have to be put off against the mountain. But the mountain wouldn't have started to grow and uh, the sheep didn't uh, uh, appreciate being put up there. Uh, even though uh, it was their own ground and uh, they'd uh, settle down and they'd stay there later on in the year. Uh, while they were hungry in the spring, uh, they'd keep coming home and they had to be turned and put back onto the ground twice a day. Uh, it used to be my job in the evening to, uh, uh, when I'd come from school, to put these uh, sheep back to the, uh, onto their own ground. And uh, our house was fairly low down, so it was all uphill after these sheep. 
and uh, it was a job I didn't like. Uh, you were on your own and uh, climbing against the hill. And uh, it would be probably an hour's work for it to get them out onto where you wanted to put them. And uh, uh, you'd come home faster. <laughs> uh, I, I remember in 1951, uh, we had um, a, a place rented that was beside us. And uh, we took in uh, uh, grazing and lambs from uh, Shamor and Glen Hest uh, that year. We had about a hundred lambs, and they were paid about they were one and three pence a month uh, for these lambs. You had them from about November day until uh, St Patrick's Day. Again, there were no fences or anything like that, and they had to be turned to keep them on their uh, keep them in their place. And uh, uh, I had to do that before school, and again uh, it, it was all uphill. But I, I don't remember that being so unpleasant as uh, uh, the longer journey. Uh, and uh, it walked when you turned the sheep, and uh, you were on top of the hill at that stage, and uh, you could run home. Uh, I might say that that was uh, a big imposition on a young lad before he went to school, but uh, uh, there were children coming much further to school. And I had to, after this uh, journey, they'd be a mile further away, and they had to uh, carry their school bag and their two sides of trough, uh, as well as come that distance. Did you have a sheep dog? Huh? Did you have a sheep dog? A which? A dog. You didn't have a sheep dog, did you? Uh, uh, not a good dog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But um, uh, he, he drive the sheep all right, but he wasn't good at getting there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but things were changing in the 1950s. Uh, before, uh, uh, was up to the 1950s, uh, when this oats was dry, it had to be scotched or flayed to get the, the seed out of the straw. And uh, that uh, was a big job. They had two sticks. I uh, had a, a photograph of it there. There were two sticks tied together with rope or with a, a leather band. And uh, you beat the shave uh, with the stick to get that oats out of it. Now, uh, uh, you'd certainly keep yourself warm at it. Uh, yeah, it's something you could do on a cold night. Uh, but the, uh, once, the tra once the tractor starts to come in in the early 50s, the trashers came. And uh, the trasher was able to take out the grain from the straw and separate the track from the straw. That was a separate job if you were uh, uh, doing it by hand. And uh, it was all done in a couple of days. You had to, uh, uh, you needed to go to help for it, but uh, the neighbours uh, helped, and each <coughs> each man had a, a generally a job that he, he was used to doing. Maybe it was uh, farking up the sheaves from the stack, or uh, taking away the straw from the thrasher, or uh, uh, feeding the, the sheaves into the thrasher. But uh, that was a, a pleasant job, and uh, uh, we all looked forward to the thrasher coming. Uh, I'm not too sure that uh, the health and safety people would be happy about that job today, because uh, it was in the days before the power checkoffs on the tractor, and the thrasher was worked with, uh, with a belt, uh, and uh, there was a, a belt wheel on the. the the tractor. They wouldn't be there anymore now. They were on the, the, on the four, old forts and majors. They were used widely for the thrasher. But uh, the thrasher came and now it's gone because they know it's been grown. Mm -hmm. Now in the uh, 1960s, uh, Production was uh, uh, fair incomes were rising uh, in the east and uh, in the south, but the west was falling behind. Uh, but at the same time, we had uh, uh, 
dairy was being introduced here in the 1950s and uh, it's recommended to, uh, they opened the creamery in Castlebar <coughs> I'd say about 1958 and uh, um, a tractor and trailer would collect the, the milk cans, the two then tin gallon uh, cans and uh, the trailer came along he put his tin gallon can up on the trailer he could have uh, uh, 50 or 60 of them by the time he reached Castle Bar. Uh, the milk was separated in Castle Bar. All they took out was the butter fat. And uh, they sent home the skim milk. And you could feed your calves now with skim milk rather than with whole milk. Uh, and you got paid for the butter. And uh, you, you, the butter really was a bonus. Uh, uh, and the uh, milk was the best thing that paid. Uh, and uh, at, uh, I'd say in the 1970s here, there'd be somewhere over 150 people between the Westport, Kilmina, and Lewisburg area sending milk to Castle Bar. Uh, now they were completely big operators. And uh, uh, there was very little regulation back in the 1960s, but uh, the regulations were starting to come in about uh, <coughs> uh, TBC and total bacteria counts and all that kind of thing. And uh, farmers would be penalised if their uh, milk wasn't up to quality. And uh, it was hard uh, to... Uh, uh, it, it was hard if the... the to bring a milk up to quality without uh, uh, investing in a cooler and that kind of stuff. Now, the technology is back working again. Uh, that's what I was talking about, the potatoes there. Uh, that's the slide that Penny gave me. And, uh, it, it's from a village called America. It's not in America, actually. It's up in Cornamona. And uh, what you see there, uh, in the, in the foreground, uh, it, it, you see the, the um, field and the ridges with the hump in the middle of it. Uh, that's obviously sown by hand. Because if it was sown, if it was worked with horses, you'd have to have a headland. But uh, when you walked it by hand, you didn't have that. Uh, there was no need for a headland. And you can see another field there in the distance. But, uh, <coughs> Uh, that was obviously a comfortable village, and uh, it, it, you have uh, very well kept houses and well patched houses. But uh, that was uh, uh, the way the potatoes were sold there, and uh, I, I said that picture uh, could well have been a congested sick boat picture. Times well, you had a market here in, uh, on a Thursday, every uh, Thursday at the clock, and uh, you'd have potatoes and oats and cabbage plants and calves and bonnets. And uh, that market would have lasted uh, well into the 80s. <coughs> as well as that, <coughs> there was no uh, liquid milk market as we call it today. And uh, when I came to town, or when I uh, started living in town in the 1970s. Uh, uh, Stephen Cain used to still come in with his ass cart and a, a can of milk in the cart. And uh, uh, if you wanted milk of Stephen, you left your jug outside and uh, you told him that he was to put a pint or two pints or three pints into this jug and he came along and poured his uh, milk in and uh, came back again the next morning and filled your jug again. Uh, I can't quite remember when he finished, but uh, he was certainly there for at the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be the same with uh, a lot of the milk sellers. That's what we call bringing in hay. Uh, when the hay, the hay was cocked, uh, when it was uh, dry enough in the field, it was put into a cock, maybe four or five hundred feet, and it was let uh, dry out further in the cock, and uh, 
when it had dried out after about three weeks, uh, it was carted in like that. And uh, you can see the way the, the hay is built on the cart. And uh, he had a lot of hay on that cart. And uh, there's a good bit of scale in building that in a way that it won't uh, uh, fall over. Uh, that you might think that uh, a lot of these jobs can take skill, but there was a lot of skill involved in that. Now, that's uh, our bank cut notes with the side. You see there, just in the foreground there, you can see two swaths that are being cut. And uh, uh, you come along and uh, take uh, handfuls there until you've got a sheet. And uh, there was a skill in lift uh, so that you picked uh, each blow of the side together. And uh, about three blows of the side would give you a sheet. That uh, was the man's sculpture now before uh, uh, the treasure came along. I'd say that's a photograph, that's another kind, uh, that's a museum photograph. Uh, I'd say that was uh, uh, taken in Connemara. The countryside is very flat and you can see a boat there in the background. But uh, uh, you scotched the sheaf with, uh, with two sticks like that swung the stick and there was a way of uh, swinging it that you didn't hit yourself but the one was swinging. <laughs> right. Now that's uh, uh, the treasure in action. Uh, you can see the, the straw coming out at the end and uh, this fellow here in the in foreground starts to start in the, the both of a week straw. The other end of the, of the, the trash of the oats came out and there was a couple of spouts there and uh, uh, you got different qualities of oats out, the uh, different spouts. You can see the big belt that's there that um, uh, people wouldn't be too happy with today and there would be a lot of kids around the day, the, the trash up. And uh, there'd be uh, <coughs> rats and mice hopping out of these stacks of oats and it was uh, fun trying to kill them. That's uh, 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 a man harrowing uh, with the horse. Uh, you can see it with an old pin harrow. Uh, that harrow would be about uh, three feet wide. And uh, he went up and down the field with that harrow. And uh, it was okay if the side was loose, but if you had uh, tough sides, uh, that harrow was no good. It would only be uh, uh, scrubbing it. We joined the common market in, uh, uh, as it was called, in 1973. And uh, uh, farmers uh, look forward to better times once we joined the common market. And uh, it didn't happen immediately, but uh, for a few years, uh, Times improved, and uh, maybe not prices improved because uh, uh, the common market was a, a cheap food area as well. <coughs> but uh, uh, they started to pay premiums on, on stock, and uh, that was uh, how farmers' incomes rose. But in the 1970s, uh, the particularly in the west here, there was an awful lot of uh, overclaimed land uh, uh, that couldn't be worked with machinery. And uh, like that's land now in the picture, uh, where you had a lot of ridges and, and uh, boulders. And uh, you could get 400 pounds an acre uh, reclaiming that in the 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, like I said, 1950s, uh, the work had to be done by hand. There was really no machinery. But in the 1980s, these uh, track figures like the HIMAX had come in. 
and uh, they were powerful machines and uh, uh, they could uh, uh, shift heavy rocks and uh, do a huge amount of work in the day. And uh, 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 I remember in the Charmland of Admoor, now just the other side of the hill from where that was taken in the 1980s, there could be uh, 20 or 30 acres uh, uh, being reseeded every year after being uh, reclaimed. Uh, uh, the whole face of Almore was changed during the 1980s. Uh, that's uh, 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 on the land that uh, uh, field that's missed out on the uh, Western Drainage Scheme. The Western Drainage Scheme is what they call it, but uh, it was for uh, reclaiming land like that. Now that wouldn't be cheap land to reclaim because it's very stony. But uh, uh, if you got the stones on that and got the level, it would be dry. Uh, whereas uh, the, in the foreground there you have the rushes and uh, you're into the rest <coughs> area there. That you need the drains there, which you need to know drains up above. Gradually, uh, as people started to uh, get a bit money, farming changed, and uh, the hens and the ducks and the geese all disappeared. Uh, uh, the potatoes and the oats disappeared. Uh, people uh, didn't milk anymore, they let the calves suck, and uh, there was uh, a lot less work. The, uh, Pigs were gone, and uh, the tillage was gone. Uh, the horses and asses are gone, uh, replaced by tractors. And you could put, uh, uh, well, probably could put a cow and a cat in the place of a horse, so that uh, uh, you were able to uh, carry a bit more stock if you, were, if you had a tractor rather than uh, rather than a horse. In the 1950s there was very little uh, which had bought in feed to be had, but practically all feed today is bought in. Uh, and uh, uh, up to a few years ago it came back, but now it's uh, an author who comes in bulk, either in a hat on uh, uh, kind of bin or uh, it's blown into a bin with uh, uh, two or three tons. In the 50s, there wasn't much work. Today, most farmers uh, will be working full time. Uh, and we're down now to uh, uh, two enterprises sheep and cattle. And uh, in uh, some places, the cattle are nearly gone. There'll be only a small, there'll be only a few farmers in the parish maybe keeping cattle. All the rest had only sheep. The reason for that was. Uh, they were um, much, easy, much cheaper to, uh, uh, to feed for the winter. And uh, if you had to house them, the housing for sheep was an awful lot cheaper. Uh, the housing for cattle, uh, the slatted housing, is very expensive. And uh, if you grow up a, a, a slatted house, uh, it has no value other than for cattle. And uh, it doesn't really. It's not something that can be sold. Uh, once you have it up there, that's your money is, is, is gone. And uh, if you don't have cattle, then it's waste. <coughs> but um, just to talk a bit about uh, uh, in my own time in Westport. Uh, in 1964, the Department of Agriculture decided to set up 12 pilot areas in the uh, 12 western counties. And, uh, they uh, had a pilot area in Westport, and Fanny here in Camino was the area that was picked. <coughs> and uh, John O'Brien, uh, a lot of us uh, who died a few years ago, John uh, was in Westport, and uh, he was asked if he'd take on the Fanny pilot area, and he did. And uh, I was. Uh, being taken on by the Commission of Agriculture at the time, 
and I was sent to uh, Westport to replace them. Uh, I, I worked nearly then for two years from uh, Finney to Lewisburg. And uh, the famine was pretty well uh, as I described it there. But uh, times were improving. But uh, slowly, farmers didn't have uh, uh, much money to invest and uh, didn't have uh, the income that would justify borrowing. So they pretty well had to, whatever improvements they had, to, they had to make it out of their own resources. But uh, <coughs> after uh, two years in Westport, I, I was asked to go to uh, Ballycroy to take on a project area there. Uh, for uh, hill sheep and uh, I, I went to Mulvaney and I was there for five years. Uh, now the farmers in, in Westport might be uh, uh, very far ahead of things but they were a good bit ahead of the Valley Coy people. Uh, the first uh, summer I was there, uh, one whole family went to Scotland uh, for the potato season. Closed up house and went, and their mother and children and a lot of them. Uh, that was just coming to an end at that time, the potato picking. Uh, if I had been there 10 years earlier, uh, that would have been a much bigger business at the time. But uh, it, it was just coming to an end. Uh, to get back to the hill sheep, uh, there wasn't a lot of money to be made out of his sheep in those years, and uh, there was only a couple of farmers <coughs> in, in Valley Cry that had 200 sheep. Uh, but, uh, and the reason for that was uh, their, an awful lot of the lambs uh, would die of hunger during the first winter. They just wouldn't survive the winter. And uh, there was no uh, talk of feeding lambs or anything like that, uh, they believed uh, they wouldn't eat in the first place, and if they did, it would do them more harm than good. But uh, in 1969, I got two farmers to feed lambs. Uh, not very much. Uh, it was a quarter pound a day for January and February. Uh, a stone a meal, that's what we talked about. About six kilos in today's terms. And uh, most of those lambs survived, they didn't all survive, but the majority of them survived. And uh, John Michael McNulty in Newport, uh, he had been struck at 180 years uh, for a good few years, and he couldn't get above 180 because uh, enough of his lambs wouldn't survive. But in a couple of years, he, he was up to 250 years. And uh, <coughs> the people. It was a bit of a laugh uh, the first year, like that, this idea of feeding, uh, feeding lambs to these, or feeding meal to these lambs. But in a couple of years, uh, when people caught on that uh, it paid, they were all feeding. And uh, it was a thing that didn't have to be, uh, didn't have to be pushed. Uh, uh, that's what you found in my job, like that. Uh, some things. Uh, paid better than others, and uh, uh, if something paid well, uh, you didn't have to, uh, you only had to start it, and it would, uh, it, it would <coughs> itself, and that was one of the things that uh, really made a difference. Uh, up, until, uh, up until then, if you got a bad year on the hill, uh, and the place would overstock, so an awful lot of sheep would die. I remember uh, 1966 was a cold, wet spring, and uh, an awful lot of sheep died. Uh, what fell, uh, normally, if a sheep dies on the hill and then you go back a week after, there's, there's only the wool and the horns left. The dogs and the foxes have uh, mm -hmm. this uh, carcass eaten. But in 1966, there were too, so many carcasses about that uh, the foxes weren't able to keep them eaten. Uh, but uh, once the people started feeding meat to the lambs, now the, the, the 
feeding a major sheep like that, it's a bit like learning to ride a bike. Once they uh, have, to have learned to eat me, uh, they'll eat it for you without any problem. But it is a problem to get them started. And uh, <coughs> they, uh, now if you the hill, if you got a bad year on the hill, the sheep were fed and they didn't die. So that numbers didn't come down. <coughs> At the same time, uh, there was uh, uh, um, there was three pounds of lamb uh, for every lamb that was produced, and uh, sheep numbers were increasing. And uh, by 19, the early 80s, the sheep premium came in, and uh, the, uh, sheep numbers continued to increase. And in the mid 80s. Uh, People started to complain that the hills were becoming overgrazed. Uh, but uh, it was paying farmers uh, to keep uh, increasing stock. And uh, the noise about uh, the overgrazing was getting louder, but uh, nothing was happening. And uh, it went on really until 1998 before anything was done about it. And uh, then the department uh, it reduced the quotas that people could keep by 30%. And uh, that's uh, uh, allowed the hills to regrow. Uh, in 2005, then, they made a change to the premium scheme. Before that, uh, you were paid on the number of uh, um, stock you had. Now they said, uh, we'll pay you uh, that amount of money which we'll pay you. Uh, and uh, you don't really have to keep stock. All you have to do is keep the land in good shape. And uh, sheep numbers uh, dropped after that. And uh, in a lot of hills now they're complaining that uh, they're undergrazed. Uh, I, I, I spent 20 years in Westport. Uh, trying to get uh, uh, sheep numbers increased so that farmers make a bit more money. And uh, I, I spent the last 15 years trying to get them reduced. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, I, I retired in, 19, in 2001 and uh, uh, they still haven't sorted out that problem. But uh, the solution to it is simple enough. Uh, the heat grows a certain amount of vegetation in the year. And uh, there's a certain amount, certain percentage of that should be eaten to keep it in good condition. If you go above it, uh, the ground will get bare. And if you don't eat that much, you'll get overgrazed or get undergrazed. But uh, nobody seems to be prepared to, to grasp that nettle. So, that's my story. Great.